It's so nice to get to come to the house of the Lord. I think that I was studying some scripture some time ago and it said that when Jesus drew near unto Jerusalem that the disciples lifted up their eyes and they saw the holy city in the distance and they begin to rejoice and to say that now will the kingdom be restored. And this certain man that was telling or talking about a recent visit to Palestine and he said that people now in the last year has been coming to a place that when they come up from the valley and look around the bend, the same road that Jesus and the disciples were on at that time, that when they see the city, they start to weep. You know, I believe there was something those disciples in those days felt that, that the kingdom would be restored again and... Now it's almost time. Amen. I believe that's the feeling. It's on the people that the kingdom is almost ready to be restored again. Amen. Brother Neville, our gracious and blessed pastor, has just spoke to me about an oncoming uh, revival effort here at the tabernacle in a few nights to be praying about it and I told him I thought it would be a blessed thing Amen. you just can't have too many revivals Amen. and many times we get the wrong opinion of a revival a revival isn't so much as to bring in new members but it's to revive that which we already have Amen. And I'm, I like to say this because I say it from the depths of my heart. That I begin to find a different feeling around the tabernacle than what has been for a long time. Amen. A feeling of, of a deep spiritual sense. Amen. Like that it used to be a long time ago. That something that settles and it's got a real foundation. And I trust that God will bless this little church. Amen. And again in its power. And I see the building program going on. And I think that's a great thing. For sooner or later, we older people are going to take off the armor and hand it back into the hands of our children and walk up that golden stairway. Amen. The other day I passed that halfway mark now of 50 years old. I just can't realize that. It don't seem like it's been no time since I was hauling groceries for Chris Meissner, about 18, 16, 18 years old. It just went somewhere. It just goes to show that here we have no continuing city. Amen. But we're seeking one to come. Amen. And that's the city where God is builder. And there will never be no end there. This morning as I was speaking on the subject of Mother's Day and trying to place Mother... Not as she really is in the old age with the wrinkles and on us, her crutches are an old wheelchair, armchair, and a little pot of flowers sitting by her, but mother in the resurrection. Amen. Restored back to her youth and standing shining as a queen. That's the way I like to think of my mother. 
I don't like to think of her as she is today. Old. I like to think of what's coming. And I know you feel that way about your mothers. Think of her as she really is. In her heart. Though many as this poet says. Life has not been easy for her. But she'd live it all over again. Just to do something for you. Amen. So God's going to make it a way so she can live forever with you. So I'm glad of that. I don't know why I made this announcement this morning that I would speak tonight, if the Lord willing, on who is this. Certainly don't know how I'm going to do it, but I've been busy up to about an hour and ten minutes ago on interviews all afternoon and had specials and and emergency calls that couldn't make them. I want you to continue to pray for Dr. Sam. He, he's coming along fine, and we're thankful. And Dr. Baldwin and Miss Baldwin are both recovering. They're getting along fine. Now, I want you to put a new one on your prayer list this afternoon. That's Harry Lee's down here, the druggist. Harry's a personal friend of mine. And as long as I've known him, I thought he was a Christian until this afternoon when his brother made requests for the salvation of his soul. Brother Mike Egan brought the, our trustee here brought the news and Harry is in a serious condition out at the hospital. I didn't know he thought that much of me, but he turned his own pastor down this afternoon, the pastor of the church where he goes and Wanted me to come see him. And I want to go see him. So I'll pray for Harry. Yeah. We're glad here tonight to recognize as my friend here from down in Georgia, Brother Welch Evans and his family. I see also other visitors that I didn't know them, probably was here this morning. If I'm not mistaken, I see Brother and Sister Elmer Collins back there from Phoenix, Arizona. Oh, you haven't changed. Look like you ought to have on your railroad clothes and, and uh, coming in from the track. And uh, welcome back home. And I can't ask you to stay here because you found a place better. See? That's very fine, Phoenix. Like to live there someday myself. And then I uh, see Brother Smith here at the Church of God out there. Brother Smith, it was giving me your little book the other day. Or yesterday afternoon late, I haven't read it yet. But I certainly will endorse it. As long as I know you wrote it. It's got to be real, true scripture. God bless you, and I hope it's a success. And many others, I could say, you're all welcome here at the Tabernacle. And I enjoyed that song this morning of Sister Stricker that sang he's looking through the lattice at her. My Mennonite brethren here, glad to have them in and all, all of you. And a friend here, I believe, from over in Illinois. Uh, his son's taking recordings in the back. Get to meet them again. And so many, I might, don't think I'm slighting you if I don't call your name, but I just welcome you all. Now let us read tonight for a scripture lesson out of Matthew, the 21st chapter, beginning at the first verse and reading down in 11th inclusive. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, there came and came to Beth, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you. And straightway you shall find an ass tied in a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say the Lord has need of them. And straightway... He will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughters of Sion, Behold, 
Thy king cometh in meekness, setting upon the ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they set him there on. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way and cut down branches from the trees and strode them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Oh, Lord, we wondered just what we would have said if we lived in those days. But we are living in a greater day when we are looking for Him to come. And as we are making preparation, Lord, getting our hearts prepared and bringing in all the sheaves that we can gather from the harvest fields, both at home and abroad. We are thinking and in anticipating on the time that we shall see Him coming, riding on a white horse, coming down from the portals of glory to change and fashion this old corruptible bodies of ours into a glorious body like unto His own. Where there can be no sin or no sign of death ever enter. And we shall see Him as He is and live and love Him throughout all ages that is to come. We thank Thee for this church and for its pastor and for the trustees and the deacons and for every person that comes here and for the visitors that's in our gates. Amen. That's sheep of the same foe but from another crowd. Amen. We would ask that you would bless them tonight with your presence and feed us on thy word. That we might go from here tonight with the determination to be better Christians than we have ever been. May we go with the new hope in our heart. And with joy waiting for His coming. If by chance there would be some among us who are sick and afflicted. We would not forget to pray for them. That they coming into the building tonight where we have gathered for the worship. Coming in sick, may they go out well. And we would ask for those that are convalescents in the homes and the hospitals and are on the beds of affliction. We pray, O oh God, that your mercy will reach down to them. We would pray for those that are indifferent tonight. Amen. That has not yet tasted and seen the Lord is good. Sure. That doesn't know what it means to be loved by God. Oh, amen. They just don't understand what they are missing. Oh, God may some radio broadcaster... Some way touch their hearts Amen. Yeah. and their 
emotions may be turned to thee before the door of mercy be closed and they be shut out to stand the judgments without mercy. Help us, Lord, these things we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus and for His glory. We ask it. Amen. The people was so crowded around the gates and the streets were jammed and there was not even room for people to sleep. They were laying outside the wall, all over the grounds, because this was the Passover. And people come from all over the known world to worship at this time. It was a time when the Paschal Lamb was slain. And the, uh, it represented their deliverance out of Egypt, the bondage. And they kept this annually. Every year this great Passover took place. And it was one of the most outstanding times of the or events of the Jewish religion because it meant the time they were delivered. Amen. All people love to think of that, the time they were delivered. How did each of us tonight can go back to the time when we were delivered. Amen. What it meant to us. I can remember in my own experience how my poor boy's heart craved to touch God. I thought, oh, if I could only go up and knock on his door and talk to him a little while. And of course, you know my story. I got me a paper and pencil and was going to write him a letter because I couldn't talk to him. And I know that he lived in the woods because I had heard him. And I'd seen his moving in the woods and I, a certain old familiar path that I used to go down when I would be hunting or going fishing. I thought I, I'll just tack it on the tree and address it to Mr. Jesus. Just some way so that that burden could be from my heart. Amen. Oh, that night down yonder. I might forget my age. I might even forget my name sometime. But I can never forget that hour when He delivered me from sin. Hallelujah. Something took place down inside me that it's helped me through the great hours of darkness the hour of my deliverance the weights of sin left me and I was a new person I'd been a new creature in Christ Jesus ever since and these Jews they come up each year and there was a, a fountain inside the church. And they'd taken the, the bread and the bitter herbs and the lamb. And they drank from this fountain in the church. And they rejoiced together because that God had showed them favor. So this being the Passover time, and not only was it the Passover, but it was a special Passover. You know, there's sometimes that we go to church, and we always love to go, but there's sometimes that something special happens. And this was one of those times. The air was charged with expectancy. 
just as it is today. All the eyes of those who loved him was watching for him to come into the gate. And I believe it's a great deal that way today. For those who love him are looking for him. The air is charged with expectancy. When we are living in this day, when the earth is actually has become one great powder keg, and science is telling us it's just three minutes until midnight, and I'm sure you was reading as I the other day that story of this general in the army said that if there was another war, it would only last just two or three minutes. The old days of battling and shooting rifles and digging foxholes, that's all over. They claim the next war will be just two or three minutes. Someday some topsy-turvy person's going to blow his lid off and fire one of those bombs. And when they do, we've got listening posts everywhere to fire it right back again. The world just can't survive that. Everyone at the Passover knew something was going to happen, but they didn't know just what it was. And that's the way it is today. Most everyone knows that something's fixing to happen. Everyone knows that. You can talk to the sinner. You can talk to the merchant. You can talk to anyone and, oh, it's such an unresting time for the world. But you can talk to a man or a woman that's looking for him coming and the glory is on their face shining out. They're watching for that great event. So the whole air is charged again. Expecting something to happen. The world doesn't know what's fixing to happen. But the church of the living God knows what's going to happen. They know that soon the trumpet will sound. And we'll see him come riding out of glory on a white horse. The armies of heaven follow him and those that are dead in Christ will be raptured and tucked up to meet him in the air. That's what we are looking for. We're longing for it. And we're told that the souls of those mothers and so forth we spoke of this morning just under the altar of God are screaming, How long, Lord, how long? Mother wants to see you as much as you want to see her. And our loved ones wants to meet us as well as we want to meet them. What a reunion that'll be when he comes to meet our loved ones and see them in their resurrection body and glorified and walking around with the air of the resurrection. Amen. Watching their character. How it's changed. The meekness and quietness. And it won't be a hustle and bustle and jump and jerk. Amen. But we'll have all eternity to live together. Amen. All this great neurotic age that we're living. Just not no time for nothing. Just climbing and jerking and grabbing why, it's a terrible day. Then, as they waited for something to happen, it was too bad that many of those at the Passover never got to see Him. Yet they know something was going to happen, but yet they didn't get to see Him. So would it be at the coming of the Lord. 
There's many restless people today that knows that something's fixing to happen, but they, they'll never see Him. Amen. For He will come in the stillness of the midnight to catch away that little church. Amen. That's longing and waiting and expecting to see Him. Amen. That's the ones He'll come and catch away. Many of the world who is living on the glamours and the feasting their souls upon the things of the world will never know what happened until the church has gone into glory. For He will come as a thief in the night and catch them away. So we can see we're back again to the same place. Now, we find out that this expectation that God comes to those who, all through the scriptures, it's been the same thing that they are, He always appears to those who are expecting Him. Amen. Always to those who are wanting to see Him. And I'm sure that that's the hope that's on our hearts tonight. Yeah. It's been about six months ago, I suppose, I was testifying to some people and I said, oh, to think of it, but just most any time he'll come. What caused me to say that? I was speaking of Brother Bosworth. When I went to see that old saint, when we heard he was dying 80-something years old, the wife and I going down to there to see him before he died, I just... Had to say something to him. I like to watch saints when they're entering glory. And I had to see him and we burnt the tires off of the car. But when I got there and rushed into the door, in a little corner laid that old patriarch. He raised his head up when he seen me come in his old feeble arms, hung out with the flesh hanging down and he reached his arms for me and I grabbed him around the neck and screamed, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. For he was a sainted, godly man. And I said, Brother Bosworth, I want to ask you something. Do you believe that you'll get well? He said, Oh, I'm not even sick. I said, well, what's the matter? He said, I'm going home. Amen. He said, I'm tired and I'm wore out. And I just want to go home. I said, then you realize you're dying? I said, I want to ask you something. Back down to the 70 some odd years of ministry, what has been your most glorious minute? Could you speak to me, sir, and tell me what experience you had down along the line that you could count your greatest hour? If I shall live to see his age, I'll never forget as those dark eyes caught me over the top of those glasses. He said, my dear brother, this is the greatest moment of my life. Amen. I can't think of any time that was any more glorious than right now. Amen. I looked him in the face and I said, sir, do you still know that you're dying? He said, brother Branham, I'm laying here waiting every minute for him to open that door and come take me home with him. That's the way to die. That's the way to go. And as you know, that about two hours before he died, he was been laying in a coma for over two days. And when he come to himself, he raised up in the room and began to speak to his wife. Then all of a sudden, he seemed to be transparent. 
And he shook hands for a solid hour or more with friends who's been dead for 40 or 50 years who was his converts in his church. Shook hands with his mother and with his daddy until he was life was left his body laid down on the pillow and went to sleep in the arms of the Lord Jesus. Amen. There's nothing like serving him. Praise God. Expecting him. And as I talked to this man about this and told that experience, I said this. I said, Sir, oh, won't it be glorious when we see him? Oh, if he would come today. He said, Brother Branham, don't scare the people like that. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, don't try to tell people that the world's coming or Christ is coming. It wearies them. Oh, I said, no, I beg your pardon. To those who are looking for him, it's the most glorious news that they can hear that Jesus Amen. is just about to break to and to take his church. Hallelujah. Old age will be changed for youth. Joy will be given in a state of gloom. Life will be given in a state of death. Amen. Immortality for morality will be exchanged. Oh, what a moment to know that he shall come. They were looking for him. They were expecting him. And when he come, we found that there was two factions. One group was for him and one was against him. And that's the way we find it today. That's what his coming always has divided the peoples. Every time when you find Jesus, you find those around who would be contrary with it. That's Satan. And today when we think of it, we don't see much change. Just the same. The peoples has changed, but the spirit of people hasn't changed. So when they finally looked out the gate and saw him come riding on that little white donkey... No one of the disciples begin to scream. The kingdom of heaven has come. The people run to meet him and all Jerusalem was stirred. There's something about it. When Jesus comes, it's always a stirring. And the whole city was stirred. And they, they can't hide it. The preachers of that day had to give an account for this stir because it was at the feast of the Passover. And they screamed out, Who is this? When the air charged and the coming of the Lord Jesus to Jerusalem had charged the air with expectations. It looks like that the teachers ought to know what was going to take place. It looked like that the high priest would have known it. It looked like that all the other priests would have known it. And it isn't changed any today because the Holy Spirit is forerunning the coming of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And as the Holy Spirit begins to stretch out across the earth, Revival fires are broken out everywhere. Great signs and wonders has been done. Healings has took place. Prophecies has went forth. All the gathering of the apostolic blessings has come back to the church again. So as it was then, so is it now. The spirit of the unbeliever still cries out, Who is this? Some of them believed on the Lord Jesus to say he was a good man. Some of them said he's a good man. That's what they say today. They try to place him as a Napoleon. A warrior. They try to place him as a, 
a George Washington, a truthful man. But he was more than that. Did you notice the reading of the scripture? They said, this is a prophet that comes from Galilee. And they tried to say the same thing today. When they see this great move of the Lord to restore back to health the sick and the afflicted. To see him use his spirit in his church to discern the thoughts of the people. To see him do just as he did when he was here on earth. To fulfill what he said would take place. Certainly, the churches and the people as asking this, who is this? They didn't understand who Jesus was because none of them could recognize him by their schools. What seminary did he come out of? What school of theology did he come from? And so is it today. Most of the people who are anointed with the Holy Ghost didn't come from any seminary. They are products of God's own choosing. But the signs and the miracles and the wonders that was promised in the Bible accompany this great Holy Spirit as it moves among the people. And they say today, what school are they from? Just as soon as you enter a city to hold a revival, what denomination do you belong to? I had an interview Friday afternoon with a, the Roman Catholic priest from the Irish church in Louisville. And no more than I had been introduced to him, a fine scholarly man. He said, Mr. Branham, what denomination are you with? I said, I'm not with any. And he said, then were you ordained? I said, yes, sir. He said, who ordained you? I said, the Lord Jesus gave me the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel and gave me a commission. Amen. Well, that's the ordination that we need. Jesus never said to his disciples, go out to the... I'm not criticizing those things, but they've lived their day. He didn't say go study to be a minister for so many years. He said... Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. He said that to men who couldn't sign their own name. And after this, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, then you shall be my witnesses. Both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost parts of the earth. That's the ordination. We have no record of Jesus ever going to any school or graduating from any seminaries. Yet there has been more seminaries erected in His name for religious causes than been for any other, any other thing that's ever been in the world. We never had any, any record of Him ever going to school. But yet there's been more schools erected in His name. Than there is of any other kind of a name. There is under the heavens. The schools. We never have note of him writing a book. Yet there's been more books wrote about him. And all the rest of the literature has been written. And today his Bible is the most popular book that there is in all the world. Amongst all the literature. But you see in the day of the visitation. They cried. Who is he? See, God takes something that seems like it's nothing to make something out of it. That's what makes Him God. And when they seen Him come riding into that gate, some of them said, He's a great man. They say that today. There are schools of theology that teaches today that Jesus was a great man. That He was a good man. Some of them even say that He was a prophet. Now, if he was only a prophet or a good man, we're in our sins. He was more than a prophet. He was more than a good man, yet he was a good man. 
Yet he was a God prophet. But he was more than that. He was God manifested in the flesh to take away sin. And as he come riding in, lots of the people said, he's a healer. Oh, we seen him open the eyes of the blind. We seen him make the crippled man to walk. We seen him offer prayer and a fever left the child. But then those type were only following him for the loaves and the fishes. And that's the way the crowds are today, many. If there's a healer, why well, they, they follow him and he's just, he's just an always. If they get sick, they run and say, Oh, will you please pray for me that the Lord Jesus will make me well. And as soon as they come out of the hospital or the sick bed, right back out into the world they go. Like a dog to its vomit or a hog to its water, as the scripture says. Just follow him for what good they can get out of him. They use him just for a, a totem pole or, or something that, that they can get from him and don't expect to serve him. That crowd still goes on today. There were nine lepers healed and one returned to give him praise. Or was it ten? They, one of them returned to give him praise. And the rest of them went ahead ungrateful. And if the people in America that's been healed by the power of God would turn their hearts to God, there'd be a revival strike this nation that would close every bootleg joint, that would package stores and whiskey stores to be plumb out of the picture. The churches would be full, the theaters would be empty on Sunday night, and there'd be a revival break out to this nation. But when they see it happen, the things that God does, they still scream, who is he? Who is this that comes? Where do they come from? Who is this? But what authority is this done? Never forget at Johannesburg, South Africa. I just arrived about 30 minutes before on a plane. I've been three days and nights in the air. So tired I could hardly stand it. They take me out to the fairgrounds where some 50 or 60,000 people were gathered. And no sooner than got on the platform to the Holy Spirit, I seen coming across the place a, a bus and it was, had a sign on it, Durban. I saw a young man have to fuss and slip away from his father and mother with one leg six or eight inches shorter than the other. He was wearing a white shirt with suspenders holding up his trousers. I, I noticed the young man. I looked back again. The vision was gone. And then just in a moment I saw that light hanging over a young man way back in the audience. And I looked. I thought I'd seen him somewhere. And I watched him and that light kept holding over him for a few minutes and I was waiting for the interpreter to catch the next words. Then I seen that same young man stand up. Throw down his crutches and his six inches short leg came down normal with the rest. Amen. And I said to Mr. A.J. Schumann, who is in glory tonight. I said, Mr. Schumann, just quote my words. It's a vision. He said, very well. And I said, the young man sitting back there with the white shirt on and the suspenders, he came from a city called Durban, some 1,500 miles across the country in a bus. And he had to slip away from his father and mother to come. But he's believed on the Lord Jesus and he's got one leg six inches shorter than the other. And the young man jumped up there he is standing, trying to feel for his crutches. And I said, young man, the Lord Jesus has healed you. And immediately his leg come out six inches to the normal with the rest of them. And they brought the young man to the platform and doctors examined him there. You see his picture in my book. 
And I'd been standing there just a few moments. I seen a little green car running down the road in the slip. It turned around backward and struck a tree. A young, blonde-headed girl was had a broken back. And I said, I see a little green car that slid into a tree and a young, blonde-headed girl of about 18 years old has a broken back. She's in a serious condition. No one responded. I couldn't see her anywhere in that vast, big audience of people. And I stood there just for a few minutes. I said, understand, it's a, don't be suspicious. It's the Lord Jesus in the power of the resurrection. He sent the Holy Ghost to continue His work. Amen. And there I seen the vision happen over again. And I couldn't see the young woman just then standing right in front of me here. Stood that light as you see on the picture. And it stood here and I walked up there and there she laid down below the platform. I said, young lady, the Lord Jesus has made you well. And she started to cry. Her mother said, oh no, don't tell her to get up. Says if she moves, she'll die. And the young lady jumped to her feet, screaming and praising God. And the mother fainted and fell in the cot that the girl was laying in. What is it? Just about that time, some critical man raised up back there and stood with one foot on one seat and one on the other and said, You, American, I challenge you to tell me what name you do this in and what denomination church do you belong to. See, it's just the same. They don't understand. They're not looking for these things. The churches are not looking for the coming of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is sure to confirm His coming to bring it to pass. So much. Each one wants to take his own way. That's the way it was there. Each group had their own idea. But that's not the question tonight. That's not what I'm talking about. But the question I'm asking you is what do you think it is? It concerns you. Who is this that's going up and down the nations? Not man. Man cannot do those things. Who is it that's speaking and saying to the people in the audience? A sitting right here, over here in different places in the meeting, when women and men are brought in here dying. Who is it? That young woman that walked into the baptistry this morning that three weeks ago dying with sarcoma's cancer lives right here on Maple Street, Mrs. Beatty. And I asked three doctors that was with her. She didn't have one chance to live with four or five little children and my mother trying to take care of them. Mama said, Bill, she'll never come home again. And I went out to where she was and the Lord Jesus spoke, Thus saith the Lord, if she will go to the church and promise to be baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus and will serve God, she'll go home. Well, and I asked her, will you do this, lady? And she said, all that you say, I'll do it. Immediately the pains left. Three days later she was home and the doctors can't find one trace of that cancer. Who is this? That cometh in the name of the Lord. Who is it? It's the Holy Spirit of God. What's your opinion of it? What's your opinion knowing your pastor? I'm when sitting in these seats here are people from out of town. Sitting with epilepsy. Sitting with... Here sits a man somewhere in here, a Mennonite brother, right here. A sufferer of epilepsy. Never knew, seen him, nothing about him. And all of a sudden, about two years ago I guess or something, two years, the Holy Spirit called it and said, Thus 
saith the Lord. Amen. He's never had a spell since. Who is it? Who is it this woman was sitting here last Sunday, the last time I was here, and come down from somewhere in Illinois the next day with a great tumor in her body that was malignant? And some of the best medical science of Illinois was taking her to a great clinic to be operated on Monday and she squeezed her way in. Never seen her or heard of her in all my life. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit shadowed her and it told her who she was, where she come from, and she was going to be operated the next day. How many were sure then to see that? Amen. And see the news flow back the next day when she went to the doctor, they take her from clinic to clinic and can't find the trace of it. Amen. Who is this? Oh, God be merciful. Who is this that's doing this? Could you dare to say it was your pastor? Never. Could you dare to say man had anything to do into it? Never. It's the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that was on our Lord Jesus. And His coming to unite Himself with His church is so close that He's spreading forth His great Holy light to redeem and to bring into Amen. fellowship a church of the living God for the rapture that's near at hand. Amen. Who is it? I can't answer your question. I can't answer for you, but I can answer for myself. And over this sacred desk tonight, in the ears of this the company and the the purchase of the blood of our Lord Jesus. I say this from the bottom of my heart. Not because that I'm one of you. Not because that I'm just somebody different, but one of the redeemed that's washed by the blood. I believe that that same light that hangs in this church tonight, that same one shows by its nature that it's Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Ghost. Anyone who knows the scripture knows that Jesus said, I come from God and I go to God. Amen. Before he was made flesh with Moses in the wilderness, he was a pillar of fire. And when Moses desired to see him, he passed his back parts to him. And Moses said, it looks like a man. When he was here on earth, he was a man. He'd done the very same things that he's doing today through man that he has redeemed. Now he comes and have his picture taken. What is it? After his death, burial, and resurrection, Paul was on his road to Damascus one day. And a great light struck him down. Amen. Those men around him didn't see the light. But it struck Paul down to it, made him blind. He had trouble with his eyes the rest of his life. And he said one time, Except I should be exalted above the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in his flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Because it was the abundance of the revelation. And when Paul was stricken down on his road to persecute the people that were making too much noise, the born-again group, the people that were called heretics, Paul was on his road to persecute those with papers in his pocket to arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. And about middle of the day, there come a light down that struck him off of his feet to the ground and he fell into the dust of the earth. There come a voice from that light saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul turned over in his blinded condition, looked up, and he could see that great glorious light. And he said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. I came from God, I went to God. I come from God, I return to God. And he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. One revelation on that sacred sand. One time upon that place. 
Man can never be the same. A man, before he should call himself a Christian, before he can identify himself, he should first have that backside of the desert experience where he met God face to face. For today you can have any kind of an answer. You can see the Lord perform just exactly what he said to and smart theologians will explain it away. They'll say that was for another day. It was for this or it's for another age or it's wrong. Like they said of Jesus, he's Beelzebub, the devil, he's a fortune teller. And all those things, they have an answer. But when a man has ever come in contact with Christ and seen him as Paul did or experienced him, there's not enough theologians in the world to ever be able to explain that experience away from a man. That's the reason today they don't have the experience. That's the reason they can't say, they're all saying, who is this? What is this? Where does it come from? They don't have the answer. Why? Because all they know is a theology that some church has made. Not to know theology is life. Not to know the Bible is life. But to know Him is life. To know Him as your personal Savior as the one who has filled you with His presence. You were there when it happened. There's nobody can take it away from you. There's no one can explain it away from you. When that experience happens to you, you know who He is. To me, He's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who is this that's performing these miracles? Who is it that's doing these great works? Is it the preacher? Is it Oral Roberts? Is it Billy Graham? Is it Jack Schuler? William Branham? Whoever it may be, they have nothing to do into it. They're instruments. It's the Holy Spirit Amen. coming forth with the gospel and signs and wonders and miracles to make ready a people. The heirs charged with expectations with believers expecting Him to come. And others are saying, why these revivals? Why do we have it? Let's settle down to a church. Why it's been said in the church right here that when we start to build a new church, say, we don't need miracles. We don't need these things anymore. If you want them, go on out on the field where they happen. We don't need them here. When the Branham Tabernacle stoops to that low place, it's sunk. Amen. This church is founded upon the principles and the power and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And as long as this tabernacle stands, may the glorious Holy Spirit find access to souls to save Amen. and fill with the Holy Ghost and heal the sick. Amen. To me, it's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let us pray. If you do not know who He is, you do not know what all this is about, and you would like to know, would you just do so much as raise your hand and say, by raising your hand, pray for me, Brother Branham, that I'll know Him. And the Lord bless you. And all around I see your hands. Now, Heavenly Father, we bring this message to And the fruits of the people raising their hands that they would like to know who this is. They would like to be acquainted with this great Jesus. That is coming of the resurrection is so close to the sixth beginning to be healed. And after that taking place, then prophecy came into the church. Then gifts and miracles. Now down to that last sign. The next will come the rapture. The church will be taken away. And we, Lord, who have claimed to know you by the power of your resurrection, we are waiting and longing and crying and begging, Come, Lord Jesus. Rapture your church and get it away quickly, Lord. For soon men are going to blow up the earth that you created for them to live on. Because they have disobeyed you. They have not studied peace but war. 
They have not studied righteousness, but they've studied mischief. How that they would not all be power hungry. Lord, that little spot in their heart that makes them hunger for power, they're trying to satisfy it in a lavatory somewhere to blow up their fellow man. God, if they could only realize that that power that they long for is the power of the resurrection of the Son of God, the power of the Holy Ghost to change their lives, not blow up nations, but change their lives. And make them your servants. Many people stricken with wild craze. They identify us as a bunch of not knowing nothing. And and as heretics as they did in the early days. But as they return rejoicing. Thanking you that they could bear the reproach of your name. That's the feeling of your children tonight Lord. Everywhere we're only happy. Some in your day tried to identify you. They said he is a friend of that wild man, John, who came out of the wilderness with hardly clothes on, just an old sheepskin wrapped around him. A wild man that flung the words east and west and said the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Said he is a, a follower of him. He's a wild man. He's mad. He's out of his mind. The supernatural ministry that was with you, O Lord, blinded the eyes of those. And so has it again today. This great Holy Spirit forerunning the coming of the Lord as John did in his day. Blinding the people to those who do not want to see, but to those who are willing to see. Thou hast chosen them. And all that the Father has given me will come to me, you said. And none of them will be lost and I'll raise him up at the last day. We thank thee for this. And those who have raised their hands tonight, we pray, O Lord God, that you'll make yourself known to them in an experience in the power of the resurrection. Grant it, Lord. And others may be here who did not raise their hand, but yet in their heart they knew that they needed it. I pray that you'll bless them. And give to them the desire of their heart. When we leave the building tonight, may we go as different people. May we go with a different purpose than we had coming in if it was contrary to your divine will. May we go out with a determination to hold to the horns of the altar until our soul is satisfied Amen. that we have had an experience with you. And we know of whom we speak because we have met him and know him and have fellowship with him. Grant these things, Father. Heal the sick and the afflicted. Bless our lovely and precious pastor. God, we pray that you'll be with him and his lovely sisters as they sang the gospel and preach it in their radio. Bless the strangers that's in our gates. Lord, may they go out tonight with a charge in their heart and a purpose that they from this hour on, if they do not know you and have not served you before, may they serve you knowing this, that all other things will come to naught, but the word of the Lord shall remain forever. Amen. Grant it, Father. Forgive us all of our sins, and may we meet at that great goal. He calls me and purchase my salvation. After the message, let's just bow our heads and worship Him. As we sang to Him, I love Him with all your heart. I love Him because He first loved me. How many really love him? Raise your hand and say, just by witness, I love him. Oh, isn't he wonderful? 
You know, I just love to sit like this and just drink in somehow. His presence, His Word gone forth, it's fallen into the heart. It corrects us, it brings us into subjection to His Spirit. How lovely it is just to worship Him there. As you go from the church tonight, go worship in Him. And remember this week, there's a prayer meeting here on Wednesday night. Don't forget Brother Neville's broadcast on Sunday or on Saturday at 9 o'clock over WLRP. I just love to hear them, don't you? The quartet or the trio sounds so pretty. Wife and I and the kiddies, we all get the little radio out and, and hover around it to listen to Brother Neville and his broadcast and his wonderful words of how he exalts the God that he loves and believes. Amen. Don't say this to you strangers here. If you're having a church home, come join with us. I tell you, not saying this to him sitting here. No, sir. I've said this many times. I love Brother Neville. This first, he's a theologian. First thing, he's a child of God. The next thing, he's the same every day. I've known him for years. He's never changed one bit. He's still Armand Neville, a servant of the Lord Jesus. And I think he's got... The other night, I called up to ask him if he didn't in his program could make room for us to come down and pray for the sick. There's some coming in. was this morning, you know. And his little wife answered the phone. And I was talking to my wife back there about it. And how we thank God for his lovely little wife and his family. That's very fine. When you see a minister and his wife getting along like that in sweetness and humbleness, that just makes the church go that much better. That's just sweeter as the days goes by. You love him with all your heart? All right. We got a dismissing song that we sang. Take the name of Jesus with you. You Give us a little card, sister, if you got it there in the book. And um, we're going to sing our dismissing song. And when we sang the first verse, we want to turn around and shake one another's hands. All right. Give us a card. The name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you, take it everywhere you go. Take this verse now. At the name of Jesus bowing, all ye prostrate at his feet. King of kings that ever will crown him. Oh, when our journey is complete. Won't that be wonderful? Precious name, precious name. Oh, Father, and joy of heaven, precious name, precious name, oh, how sweet, how sweet, oh, Father, and joy of heaven. How many remembers our little song we used to sing, Don't Forget the Family Prayer? You remember it? I don't think, I don't know where you know I it was calling on. Let's try it once. How, don't you remember it? Let's, maybe I can try it once with you. Don't forget the family prayer. Jesus wants to meet you there. Amen. He will take your every care. Oh, don't, don't forget, forget the family, family prayer. How many has family prayer? That's good. Let's try it again. I'll get that back in here. I like that. All together now. Don't, don't, don't forget the family prayer. Jesus wants to meet you there. He will take your every care. Oh, don't forget the family prayer. Oh, Lord. It is written in the scriptures that they've taken from the body of Paul, Amen. handkerchiefs or aprons, and Amen. unclean spirits went away from the people and diseases were healed. 
We pray, O oh Lord, that like manner it shall be shown upon these tonight as I send them to the needy and the sick. Out somewhere in the lands, there's someone expecting and waiting this to happen. Yes. I pray, Father, that you'll grant it in the name of Jesus, my son. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask as we bow our heads, if our most precious brother Smith over there from the Church of God, who we have found, just like our brother Neville here, to be a loyal, faithful Amen. servant of God. Blessed. I'm going to ask him to ask the blessings upon you to continue through this coming week. Amen. God bless you till we meet you again, Brother Smith. <laughs> Shake each other's hands. Welcome back again to the tabernacle. God bless you.